Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have each and every one of you here with us today to be in conversation with Warren Benford and Michael Bohenick as they talk about their wonderful new publication, Hear My Voice. I'm not sure about each of you, but I know that I was excited when this book came onto the scene as a bookseller, as an attorney, and as an educator. I can't imagine a more relevant book for our times. In fact, this picture book is already being called with its heart-wrenching and hopeful words and innovative artwork, some, one of the most important picture books of the year, and I believe that it is. So today in collaboration with Indies Unite, which is a group of independent bookstores working together to put together a hard-hitting hard series of virtual groups challenging the status quo and bookshop.org, we are presenting Hear My Voice by Warren Binford and Michael Bohenick. Um, Warren Benford is the, um, excuse me, Lilith. Warren Benford is the endowed uh, chair of pediatric law, ethics, and policy at the University of Colorado. Um, she is an international children's rights expert, published nearly 60 law review articles, book chapters, essays, and other publications. Um, she has her JD from Harvard Law School, and she holds an EDM from Boston University. Michael is a senior counsel at children's at the children's division, children's rights division of the Human Rights Watch, focusing on juvenile justice and refugee and immigrant children. He's researched and reported on criminal and juvenile justice and prisons conditions, the protection of refugees and internationally displaced persons, and the exploitation of migrant workers and other labor issues. He also holds he holds a bachelor from Michigan State University and a law degree from Columbia. In addition, he speaks Spanish, Portuguese and English, which is um, a big important part of this book as it is published and I'll hold it up for everybody in both English. And it's a great flip book also published in Spanish. One of my favorite parts of this book. I remember the first time I picked it up, I'm like, why is this so heavy? It's so heavy in so many important ways. So for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Warren and Michael as they first speak with each other about their work. And then in a few minutes, we'll get some of your questions as well. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Christina. And thank you for all of you for joining us today. And Michael, oh my gosh, I've missed you so much during the pandemic. I know that we were heading down the border pretty frequently and furiously until it all came to a halt early last year. And I first wanna just say, how are you doing, Michael? Where are you? What kind of work are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm in New York right now, and I've been in New York for a, a couple of weeks. Um, you know, the pandemic really did stop the work, uh, the in-person work on the border, but it didn't stop the work entirely. So at least from my side, it turned out that I was able to do a lot of WhatsApp calls, a lot of, uh, a lot of video calls with people who were on either side of the border. And in some ways, I think they even welcomed um, the opportunity, even if it was only on a screen or over a, you know, over a speaker, to be able to talk to somebody about what they were, they were experiencing. But yeah, it's been a long couple of uh, years. Yes, it certainly has. Do you remember when we first met in 2017? I was just thinking about that. I, uh, my memory of it, it was at a conference table in a detention, immigration detention center um, in South Texas, just before we walked into a series of interviews with women and mostly women and their and their their children about what their experiences were in immigration detention. So yeah. it's quite a quite a trip. And do you remember the report that you were working on at the time? You're gonna have to remind me. Was this the was was I working on the freezers report then? You were. This, this is. You wanna... uh, yeah, um, and so the first point of contact that people have with the United States, with United States officials, with the immigration, with any immigration agent is um, apprehension at the border and detention. So they're locked up um, in very, very small holding cells that were designed to be really temporary facilities, designed for like a few hours, designed with uh, an adult population in mind, built at a time when most people who were locked up were men looking for work and were there for really only, a, you know, really less than a couple of hours. And 
as a result, they're not really suitable in any way for longer term detention. And they're definitely not suitable for children. Nonetheless, um, families, and in some cases, single kids who were, you know, unaccompanied kids were locked up in, in, in these very, very tiny cells, sometimes in really overcrowded conditions, um, essentially a bit of a black hole because nobody knows what goes on inside there unless you can find some way, as you and I did, of getting in and talking to them. And the reason that it's called, that I called the report the freezers report is because everybody referred to these cells as the freezers because they were so cold that they felt like freezers. And I have to say, they really were cold. I, I was able, because I'm you know, a lawyer, whenever I went into those, to take in, I basically took in the same kind of things we would take on a, on a hike when the weather's gonna change. So I had a wool layer, I had another layer. I, I was thought I was prepared, but I still would have to get up after doing, you know, talking to people for, for a couple of hours straight, I'd have to get up every half hour and walk around because my fingers were cold and my toes were cold. And, uh, you know, and I, and I was able to wear extra clothing, which, which most people were not. Yeah. And then do you remember, we did some other visits, a number of visits and, and one of the next big visits wasn't the very next visit, but you know, it was later on that year, we went to the Walmart together. And do you remember we went to the Walmart and we saw about 1500 kids who were made to line up in single file lines and basically march in single file lines past that mural of Donald Trump three times a day, actually six times if you talk about coming and going. You know, and at the bottom of that mural, it said something to the effect of sometimes in order to win the war, you have to lose the battle. And I couldn't figure out what what that meant. And I, I go back to that again and again, you know, what is this messaging that we have these kids dressed in uniforms marching, you know, past this this mural and we went over to the, um, the adult detention center while we were in the area and we interviewed some of the parents who had been separated from their children. And so we were hearing from the children, some of their accounts of being separated from their families. And then we heard some of the parents who had their children taken away from them. And I remember that the stories of kids who were being taken under false pretense. I remember that one mom who told us that she was told by government authorities that her child was being taken to the showers and that she was then taken away from her child and that she had not seen that child since. And I remember I had the chills because of what happened in the Holocaust and the separation of children from their, their parents and, and being told that the children were being taken to the showers. And I was thinking, my God, you know, what is going on here and what are we doing? And then the children that we interviewed, some of the children that we interviewed talked about after darkness fell, being put on buses without their parents and driven for all night long across, presumably across state lines until they were taken to the bus station in a giant city in Texas and then put on vans and then eventually taken to Casa Padre, that Walmart or other places. And I'm wondering if you had ever seen anything like that previously in history, you know, as you interviewed children and adults around the world of this separation of children from their parents and, you know, explanations like that you know, being given and then basically, you know, the kids almost, you know, virtually being kidnapped by the government, you know, from parents. It is amazing how inventive, and I mean inventive in a nefarious way, governments can be when they want to, right? It would take very little to be, um, uh, to treat people with basic humanity and dignity, right? Like, you know, fair enough, um, have some sort of processing system in a reception center that offers the kind of uh, sense of security and safety that, that people really need after long journeys. But, um, but uh, yeah, that's not, that's not what we were seeing. I mean, there's a couple of things that you've mentioned that I think are maybe worth uh, just, just going back to. Um, 
people hear Walmart and I think they, they think, oh, we went shopping. No, it was a converted Walmart and it was apparently one of the, do they call it a super Walmart? Four times yeah. the size I kept hearing of the yeah. ordinary Walmart. Converted into a child protection shelter. So stop for a minute there and think about, you know, like how do you have children adequately cared for in a facility of any significant size, let alone when there are 1,500 and it's a size of a, a, super, a, a, a converted Walmart. Um, now that, that's, that's pretty incredible. And then add to that the sort of deception, the lying that, that was happening, that immigration agents, individual immigration agents, not all of them, some of them were, were actually quite, um, you know, I think quite concerned about what was going on. Maybe we can talk more about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, just just not even owning up to um, their part in what was really a horrific set of circumstances. And so I would hear people, parents tell me again and again, oh yeah, um, the agent said, she'll be right back. We're just taking, or the agent said, you have to go to court, but when you come back, your kid will be here. And none of that was true. I mean, so, so, so of course what, what happened then is, the, that was how the family separation policy of the Trump administration was carried out. That was when it was carried out. Kids, and in some instances, kids taken away from the arms of their parents. Now, Warren, one story that always gives me the chills is when I think it was you, if I'm not mistaken, had to stop a, a parent and child from being removed from each other without having a chance to say goodbye. Do you remember that in, in the... Um, in one of the, uh, what's one of those, one of those freezer facilities, one of those small scale border detention centers. What, what was the context? What, what happened? You know, I, I, I think that you and I need to sit down and write a historical account of what happened, because I fear that you know, with each passing day. I remember less and less the details of it, but I, but I do, now that you mention it, I do remember, you know, having to argue and basically force the, uh, you know, the parent and, and, you know, and the child from, you know, being separated. It was actually the one that I'm thinking about was in San Diego. Do you remember that? I, I don't think I was, I don't think I was there for that. But. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the one that that's coming to my mind, and it, it it's absolutely brutal. I mean, it's just it you know in, involves um, a child who had cerebral palsy, whose dad had basically was four years old, and he was about the child was about 32, 28, 32 pounds, something like that, and and the gangs had targeted the family. The dad was a small business owner. It was like a produce shop. He didn't pay enough, and so they literally walked all the way with three children, including this, this, you know, son with cerebral palsy on his chest. And they um, walked through a, a sandstorm in the desert crossing into the U.S. They had family in the U.S. They had uh, a nephew that they had raised since he was six months old, whose mother is the father's sister lived in the U.S. And they came and, and they, they virtually, you know, arrested the dad, took the boy with cerebral palsy away, took a newborn baby away. And then they were going to take the four-year-old nephew that he and his wife had raised away without saying goodbye and you know when when I found out I got very upset <laughs> I was very insistent about the trauma that was going to be caused to this four-year-old boy if they did not let you know him say goodbye to the only father he had really known who was you know technically his uncle but factually you know the father because he's the one who had you know cared for him as a father since since he was an infant and, and, and um, you know, and they just, they, they held each other and they hugged each other for so long. And it was such a meaningful connection to, to witness. But then in the course of, of that, we discovered that these other two children had be, been taken away, including, you know, the cerebral palsy son and, and the infant. And we were able to work with hospital attorneys and, and other attorneys to force Border Patrol to bring this family together and to exempt them, you know, from these family separation practices that that they were implementing on a widespread basis, and um, you know that family is doing well 
and pursuing their legal claims to remain in the United States. But when you think about the brutality of breaking up a family that includes an infant, a cerebral palsy boy who has been physically, you know, in his father's arms almost his entire life, as well as this other nephew, it really gives you a window into the, you know, the inhumanity that, that we were witnessing. You know, and, and we witnessed that again when we went to the Torneal Tent City, where literally that was set up intentionally in, uh, you know, on land that only the federal government had jurisdiction over so that they could keep 3,500 children in tents in the desert. And, you know, that's that picture that I'm using as a backdrop today. And then, of course, we famously, first time that we went public, went into the Clint Border Patrol facility in June 2019. And those were the accounts that were used for Hear My Voice, Escucha Mi Voz. What do you remember about Clint? Well, that was really remarkable because, you know, although by that point I'd been in a lot of Border Patrol facilities, um, there was nothing, I don't think, quite matched what I was seeing and hearing, uh, more hearing because we weren't technically allowed to go beyond the interview rooms, although I know you uh, you managed to do so. Um, but, uh, you know, just, just um, the sheer number of kids, first of all, Second, the um, the conditions that they that they were coming to us, and we were we were essentially looking at the roster, the sort of like the, the roster of kids in the in the facility that day, pointing to ones that we wanted to see based on you know whatever criteria we could get. But the point for us was that we were choosing, not the institution was choosing who we spoke to, and um, and, and then they would come they would come to us, you know, sort of like exhausted, um, visibly dirty, the faces still had dirt on them, wearing the same clothes they'd arrived in. Um, when we asked how long they'd been there, in some cases it was a week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, no showers or really irregular showers. Um, it's hard to tell what was going on there because the facility did have some access to showers. Some kids had been able to get some, but we never, I, at least I don't think I ever quite figured out on what basis they offered some kids showers and how frequently. Um, and then the final thing, I guess, is just that they were, well, two final things. One was that they had packed in so many kids that they were successively repurposing different parts of the facility so that there was what uh, appeared by, by from the descriptions of the children to be sort of an ordinary set of cells with way too many kids in them, along with a sort of newer section that was essentially like a very, very large dormitory um, with what sounded like dozens and dozens of bunk beds in it. And then also a repurposed loading dock. They'd sort of like just, Put a roof over a temporary roof over something and thrown thrown a bunch of kids into what was I, it sounded to me like a loading dock and when we drove around that's exactly what it looked like and then you know the, and then the final thing and i think possibly the most heart-wrenching was just hearing kid after kid say that they had, hadn't talked to their parents since they'd arrived that their parents as far as they knew had no idea where they were and sometimes we were picking up our phones and just trying to reach people and it was the first time in weeks that the parent had any idea that not just where the child was but that the child was safe yeah you i remember when we were calling the parents and we normally didn't call parents when we interviewed children we normally didn't call parents but because of the extreme neglect and arguably abuse that we were witnessing we started calling the parents. These were highly distressed children. And virtually every single call that I placed, either the parent or family member picked up immediately or listened to our message and called back within two minutes. These were all kids. There wasn't a single call that I placed that wasn't answered or responded to immediately. So these were not kids who were lost who were without family. And I remember parents saying, you know, I will get on the next plane. Where do I go? Where do I go to pick up my daughter? Where do I go to pick up my son? Or I will send you the money. 
you know, I'm here in Los Angeles, I'm here in Dallas, like, tell me where to send the money so that you can send, you know, my child to me. These were not kids who were abandoned. These were not children who were unloved. Every single one of them had usually a parent, but not a, a parent than a close family member, like a grandma who was waiting for the child in the United States and seemed to be fully capable and expecting to take care of them. And so there was really no need for these children to be in government care. And, in a, you know, I know that you refer to it as a dormitory, but I, I want to make clear it was a warehouse. That dormitory was a warehouse. And that when the kids were describing it, we couldn't figure out based upon a layout of the Border Patrol facility where it was, what it was that they were describing, because like you say, it sounded like a dormitory. But then when we drove around, we saw that brand new warehouse uh, that had been erected recently. And we realized when we went the next day and had some of the children draw pictures of where they were staying, that the pictures that one of the boys drew, the picture that one of the boys drew right down to the number of porta potties outside the door and the location of the shower trailer, which had been brought in a few days before, according to a number of children's accounts, that it matched precisely. And then it was like, oh my God, our worst fear is true. They are literally warehousing children. And we decided to contact the children's attorneys and to let them know what was going on. And it's really the first time that you and I had talked to the media about a visit that we had done. And that led to this book. So why do you think it was so important for us to go public about what it was that we were documenting in the court case, Flores, which is what had taken us into a lot of these facilities in the first place? And so, you know, ordinarily we, we are going to these facilities for the purpose of informing the court about compliance or lack of compliance with um, the basic court order about keeping kids in safe and sanitary facilities. And, you know, I, I, I can't say that what we typically found was very good. Um, and in fact, our reports to the court were pretty scathing. But uh, this was so bad for all the reasons that we've talked about. Kids held, you know, in, 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 uh, in it effectively amounts to what we in, in my job, I often see in, in uh, countries that don't that that have far less um, pretense of a respect for rule of law. Um, the practice practices like incommunicado detention and enforced disappearance. That's what this felt like, right? Kids are thrown into a, a facility and not and and nobody is told where they are. And to be to be put in such conditions, I think for anybody would be really um, difficult for children, so much more so. Um, not even, not even uh, getting to the factors that led them to leave their country, to flee their country, and to try to seek safety in the United States. So not only are these children um, who have, as we know, a whole variety of needs and a whole lot less preparation in terms of dealing with adversity. Um, as compared with adults, but also many of them had suffered torture in their home countries, death threats, threats of, of really serious kinds. And that was the motive for, for leaving in many cases. Um, they'd done so, they'd had a really arduous journey through Mexico, um, you know, traveling on their own or traveling with, with adults who may or may not have had their best interests at heart. And, uh, and, and then they've arrived in the US and they think they've finally reached safety and they think they're gonna be with relatives. And to sort of be let down in this way, I think would be devastating for any kid. I think for, uh, for um, this particular population, it was really traumatizing. So all of those things were, were I, I think why we, you know, it was, it was still a discussion we needed to have uh, with the rest of the legal team. But it was a relatively, you know, once we started laying out what kinds of things we were seeing and just how, just what a radical 
departure this was from any sort of acceptable, safe and, and secure, safe and, safe and healthy um, environment, it, you know, it really, it really then became quite easy to think we needed to do something to let the general public know what was happening. So Michael, there are a couple of questions coming in in the Q&A. Um, the first one is, what have you two experienced are the most common general challenges in classrooms or having discussions around books like this? And both in mainly white student populations, but also in more diverse class populations. Yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna start first or shall I go? Why don't you go first? Well, I guess what's interesting about this is that, you know, obviously, and as this discussion sort of illustrates, we're throwing up a lot of a lot of things that are sort of um, both individual policies. Family separation is one. Automatic detention at the border is another. We haven't talked about some of the other Trump era policies that um, that came into play later on. So so after these visits that we've been talking about. Um, and finally, uh, an immigration law that is pretty hostile and has been pretty hostile since 1996 to asylum seekers. Um, so it's complicated to sort of get all this in a way that that is that makes any sense because in some ways it's almost designed not to make sense. And that's true with whomever we talk about. I think that um, the more diverse the audience, the more um, this sounds like not, not an unfamiliar account. Not this, these aren't unfamiliar, unfamiliar events, unfortunately. And so uh, those discussions, I think, in fact, are a little bit easier because there's a sort of common understanding of what's happening. Um, my, my mother still tells this story about sort of realizing that not every family has the same experience of, of, of immigration, of contact with Border Patrol that, you know, say, would be, I think, unfortunately, all too common for, for Latinos. So she's talking about um, her own experiences of being stopped at the border, being pulled over um, between, the, between the U.S. and Canada for speaking Spanish to her, her, her mother as she's, as she's crossing. And I remember one of these from when I was a kid. And she told this story to a friend of hers uh, who is white, who could not believe that this happened. She said, no, 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 we cross all the time. This, they never pull us over. What do you, how can this possibly? So, and she, and she was saying like, how can, how could it be that she doesn't know that this doesn't know that this, that this is happening? That this has been yes. going on for, for decades. Um, and I think sometimes there's uh, just a sort of a, a difference in, in perspective that really is, Means that you start at a at a much more at a much uh, earlier stage and sort of like having to set the scene when talking about these kinds of issues. Yeah, I don't know what your experience is, Warren, in your classroom settings, for example. Well, and there are a couple that come to mind. Um, one is, you know, I I was very humbled to receive from a fourth grade classroom uh, an email from their librarian telling us that their fourth grade had selected Hear My Voice as the book of the year, and that, that that's what the children voted, their book of the year. And it was a classroom in the Bay Area that was predominantly Latino, Latinx, and it reinforced exactly what you're saying, that in some populations, this is a truth that is part of their family history that is part of their community history, even if it's not part of their direct family history. And so to be able to see it in print and to see the powerful pictures that accompany it and to know that, you know, people sometimes refer to this as our book and you and I are trying to be very clear, this is not our book. This is a children's book. It is written by children. And every single part of the text content, except for your introduction, my back matter, is taken directly from the children's own testimonies, word for word. 
and that they are basically arranged thematically, but they are all the children's words that they, they come from the testimonies that, that the children gave us during the interviewing process. And so this is very much their book. They are the authors. Um, and I think that that approach, that firsthand testimony being amplified, being elevated and giving, you know, bringing to light publicly what many families experience in the United States really resonated with this population of students. And, and so I think that in that type of setting, it's, it's very affirming to have their history told and particularly to have their history told by other children who have, have lived through these harrowing experiences. I think that in, you know, in mixed classrooms or white dominant classrooms that we run into the same challenges that you are describing in the border crossings with your own mom when she was speaking Spanish, which is something that I've experienced as well, which is that I have had a lovely, peaceful relationship with police historically. I had a lovely, peaceful, you know, highly facilitating relationship with border uh, and other immigration officers historically. And when I married my husband, who does not appear as I do, that we were stopped almost every single time that we crossed as a couple. Whereas when I was crossing individually with my own presentation, it was no problem. I was always passed through, everyone was always lovely. And, and when you start to be exposed to other people's experiences, you start to understand that your experience is not definitive you know, for the universe of, you know, of, of people. And, and I think that this book helps to bring into the consciousness for those who experience different types of privilege, whether it's their neighborhood or their skin color or their educational, um, you know, history, uh, socioeconomic status, whatever it is that privileges them from uh, being native born, um, that, that it, it, this book helps to create that mosaic of other people's experiences, other people's history that help to inform the decisions that we make as citizens with the power of voting. And that's one of the reasons why I believe so strongly in educating openly and accurately, but with the appropriate levels of adult support and guidance of what is happening in the world for our children. And so, you know, I talk with my own children about immigration practices. I talk about our own children about the consequences of the climate crisis. I talk with our own children, you know, about, you know, racial justice and the need to address racial injustices. And it's only when they have an accurate understanding of the truths and the different perspectives and the different experiences of what's happening in the world, will they be able to be responsible citizens, you know, in my mind, and be able to exercise that very serious power of, um, you know, voting in a democracy that helps to change the course of history. Um, there was another question that came up and it says, during what part of this process did you realize you had a, a picture book? In other words, how or when did you decide that a picture book was the best avenue to amplify the children's voices? And um, Michael, if I could go first on this one. So as you'll recall, we had an overwhelming um, media storm when we went public about the children at Clint. And we had about 10 days of round the clock coverage. And although we were really grateful for the opportunity to educate the public about what was going on at the border, it seemed as though the children were getting lost and it was being pulled into debates about immigration and it was being pulled into partisan politics and the children themselves were being politicized and they were relying on us to you know speak to the issue and losing the children's voices and their accounts in the process and i remember talking to different um media uh both you know, reporters and, and, and news anchors and such about you, you need to go to the court records and read the children's testimonies, because at that point, the attorneys had filed a TRO. And so a lot of the testimonies were publicly available, but they were behind a pay paywall. And the, and, the, and the reporter said, you know, it's too difficult for us to get to those testimonies, tell us what they say. And it was at that point that we talked about creating a pop-up nonprofit 
to post the children's testimony so that anybody in the world could access them directly, read them for themselves, and that we then would call on artists and musicians and other creative types to read the children's testimonies and find ways to um, tell the children's stories and help amplify their choices and uh, voices. And that's when, um, you know, the idea for the children's book, there were, of course, some art exhibits that were created. There was, of course, the music, the musical theater community created the, you know, the events in Chicago. We had the Broadway community create the videos by different um, actors and high profile individuals in New York. We, of course, had the, you know, call from Neil Simon, was it? No, Neil, um, oh, who's the, the songwriter who called up the folk you know, music community and asked for songwriters to write songs. And one of them became the semifinalist for folk song of the year. And it was just overwhelming the number of people. We, of course, had the first um, episode from uh, South Park do an entire episode about the Clint Border Patrol station. We had the, you know, the comics book that was created based, inspired by the children's testimonies. And so, you know, the children's book was basically the contribution of the children's book illustrators and then, you know, the creative design team coming forward and saying, here's what we can do to help amplify the children's voices. But the idea was to recognize the role that artists and musicians and, and people in the humanities play in helping to inform and imbue and interpret history. And I think they did an amazing job, you know, with all of these initiatives, including this book, which, you know, I think is so powerful. And I'm so grateful to the, it almost was a hundred people when you include the children and the illustrators and everybody else, the publisher who all came together and, and you know, like ponied up the money for the, you know, making sure that it appeared in both English and Spanish, which I agree is so critically important. So do you have anything to add about, you know, the children's book and, and the inspiration for it? Well, I just, I, I think that it was inspired, right? An inspired choice on your part to try to, to try to uh, pitch this in this way. Um, not because you would necessarily want a child to read it without context, but because it is just such a, um, an amazing way to, to, re to remember that these are the words of children. And I think it does get to the, to the other question that's been, that's been posted, which is about trauma and the relationship between trauma and art. Um, the, and the, the, the writer says, you take darkness and you somehow end in hope. Is that art or is that something else? Um, I wonder what you think about that, Warren. You know, it, it's it's hard to think deeply because I feel somewhat traumatized, you know, having witnessed child abuse and neglect intentionally uh, committed, you know, by our government in our names, purportedly on our behalf, you know, and, and to witness that and to be able to do so little about it. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's anything more than passing the baton. And maybe this is what is the hope, is knowing that we're not alone in doing this work, that you and I can use our law degrees and our you know, roles as children's rights experts um, to be invited to visit these facilities and interview the children and document what, what we see. Um, but I don't have the ability to organize the art exhibit that happened near the White House with over a hundred you know, pieces of, of conceptual art created. I didn't, don't have the power to, to create an illustrated children's book. I don't have the power to, you know, write a song or perform a song. And, and, and so I think it's like looking beyond ourselves and what we can do and seeing that there are other people who also care, who trust us in the accounts that, that we both collected and that we give about what we witnessed. And it, it could be like the hope of being in community of caring about children that most of whom you and I will never meet, most of whom the country will never meet and, um, and asking people to find ways to express their, their talents, their gifts, their expertise, to 
create a community of caring for these children because if nothing else this book says to the children we hear you you know we have taken the words that you've shared with us and we have put them out in in you know the world's history and it's a way to like affirm their experience and to um you know to acknowledge the harm that's been done to them and i think that that helps that can help give them hope and it also can help give i think the world hope that when we're all feeling despair over some of the things that are happening in the world that that we can't take away the cause of that despair but that we can give hope by saying we hear you we share your concerns and we're committed to work with you to find ways to to move forward to address these things what do you think well, I think there's something also um, very human about hope, that we all have hope, hopefully, hopefully we all have hope. Um, the children that we, we've talked to all have hopes. We would end our interviews talking to them about what they were plan, what they would, would hope would, would be their life in, in, in a year or so. Um, and, or they would just tell us these things. And I was thinking about when I was reading this question about a different context where I've been doing a lot of work in uh, in France, where I've been interviewing a lot of children and adults who are who are migrating. Their intent, in in many cases, is to is to go on to the United Kingdom, and so they're camping out in forests, under bridges, and so on in northern France. And one of the people that I met during this um, during during my time there is a a photographer who is himself. A refugee. He was recognized as a refugee a few years ago in France. And he takes a lot of images that are really about documenting misery and trying to show the world what uh, the authorities in Europe are putting people who are seeking safety through. And so he's, to that extent, a photojournalist. But a lot of his images are hopeful, are that they show people enjoying themselves despite misery. They show sort of a triumph of human spirit over these really adverse conditions. And I don't know if that's art or something else, or if it's if it's all of those things, including the reflecting the reality that humans are complex enough that we can be in enduring great hardship um, and also retain our sense of our of our dreams, our goals, our vision, the things that motivate us to keep on going forward. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because as 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 you were talking about the children arriving to the United States, it reminded me of how hopeful almost all of them were. You know, that despite everything that they were going through, and the brutality that they were experiencing, almost all of them had retained that hopefulness that brought them to the US to begin with. And I think about some of the research that's been done around children who arrived to the United States that shows that they are far more resilient than my children are you know, who are native born and that, and my children are wonderful and they're tough and they're smart and resilient. But like these kids arriving to the United States, when you think about the conditions that they have gone through in order to get here. And then, you know, when they arrive, we basically have this incredible gift of having these really smart surviving children who are resilient and hopeful and excited in many cases to come to the United States, I'd say most cases, to come to the United States. And what we really should be doing is to recognize the gift that these kids are and to do everything that we can to foster, to cherish and foster that resilience and to help grow them into really strong leaders and community members and yet the research shows that within two years of arrival, the resilience advantage that they had when they arrived to the United States had been worn down by the traumas they experienced at the border and then the racism that they experience once they start to integrate into the US. And so I think that you know, part, part of it is to take these very hopeful, resilient children and 
create a child centered border management policy and system that recognizes who they are and, and the gift that they are to our country and our communities and to, you know, protect those attributes rather than wear them down, the kids down, you know, with the, with the mistreatment that, that we witnessed and documented. Warren, there's a question about the pandemic, how it's affected children and what's being done uh, to try to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 while also keeping families together. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about that, but if you want to go ahead um, start to start us Never. off. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Michael? Well, I'm just thinking of a couple of, of things. One is that, you know, it the answer depends a bit about which group of children we're talking about. So for children who are arriving today, at, at the border, um, there is unfortunately for many still a Trump era rule in place in the name of public health, of, of sort of in the name of COVID prevention that allows border patrol agents to turn people back, to summarily expel them, no due process, no hearing, no, um, you know, no pretense at sort of like trying to figure out if they're if they have a claim for asylum that should be taken 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 uh, taken seriously. That's true for adults arriving. That's true for adults arriving with children. So so families that arrive, that doesn't apply to unaccompanied children at the very least. But everybody else can be summarily expelled under this under this. Um, it's not even a law. It's a uh, in my mind, questionable application of a hundred-year-old law that um, is has a very vague regulation and is based on an order by the Centers for Disease Control. Right, so its legal basis, I think, um, as a lawyer, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical about. Nonetheless, more than a million people have been turned back, have been have been expelled, and so that's not about so much about keeping families, it doesn't have the purpose of keeping families together. It doesn't have the purpose, even I don't think really of keeping families safe or the United States safe, because at the same time, we're of course seeing the borders open um, as of last week for um, tourists traveling from Canada or, or Mexico by land um, with a vaccination card. I mean, there's there are clearly other ways as, as the US government has recognized in the case of casual tourism, there are other ways of safeguarding the population at large against the pandemic. And the equities to my mind suggest that when you've got people who are fleeing persecution, fleeing serious harm, that you should find some way that bends over backwards to accommodate their safety and resolve whatever issues that, that, that you need to resolve with respect to, you know, uh, disease, well, virus, the, the prevention of the spread of, a, of, 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 of COVID-19. Um, yeah, so, so that's a bit of a partial answer to that question in any event. Yeah, you and I are, will be going back to the border here in a couple of months. It'll be our first time together since the pandemic led to the shutdown in the US. What do you think we're going to see? I don't know. Um, I don't know because, you know, we've talked a lot about US government actions, and we haven't really talked about what Mexico is doing or not doing. And unfortunately, um, a lot of what Mexico is doing, uh, the government is doing is not great in terms of, in terms of its own refugee protection practices. So a lot of people, we're hearing a lot of accounts of people being pushed from Mexico into Guatemala, for example, being rounded up in the northern cities of Mexico, so the ones that border the US. Um, and at the same time, some of the state governments um, on the border, uh, I mean, for example, Chihuahua, for example, for, you know, as one, as one state, state government, seem to have done quite a lot to try to figure out both the best ways they can of 
recognizing that they've got large numbers of people who, who intend to travel onto the US when it becomes possible, who need shelter, who need healthcare, who need um, access to basic to the basic necessities of life. And uh, and and you know, I just don't know enough about what they're doing with respect to the pandemic. The last time I was there was, I guess, in still in uh, in late March 2020, so just before the borders effectively closed, um, and at that point at least, uh, Sida Juarez felt safer in terms of COVID prevention than El Paso did. I wonder if that'll be the same. I I really honestly don't know. Yeah. Do you um do you want to talk a little bit about the research that we want to do next related to education and children in migration? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just say one or two things that I know you've got you've got thoughts as well. Um, I think because Mexico is obviously historically a transit country and increasingly a destination country for a lot of people both people who are fleeing harm and so are entitled to asylum and, and others who, who may be fleeing for or traveling for reasons that aren't necessarily recognized in law as a basis for, um, for, for switching countries. But we all know that in real life are very, very real reasons for doing so. And so the reality is that there are lots of people in Mexico who are migrants, who are who are, whose country of origin is somewhere other than Mexico. And I think one of the questions is, as for in particular, those who were pushed back into Mexico from the US, either under a program called Remain in Mexico, a program where people were allowed to seek asylum in the US, but told they had to wait in Mexico while they did so. And so some 60,000 people were, were in this situation or those who were summarily expelled, or maybe new arrivals who haven't even tried to cross yet, what is the situation for them, and in particular for children, in terms of, of uh, access to education? They've got a right to it. Um, now that in many cases, people have been in Mexico far longer than planned, um, I would hope that they're able to send children to school and that, that, and, that, and, that, and that children have been receiving an education for the last couple of years. But we know, at least anecdotally, that that doesn't happen a lot. Either there are barriers from the school or that the, the physical location of the school is too far away or the parents are fear, fearful. There are lots of reasons why that may not be happening. And I think one of the questions that, that we have is, what is Mexico doing about education for these children, for children that are staying, I think in many cases, far longer than they had planned to, than their families had planned to, and may end up being there for a good portion of their childhood. Yeah. Well, I am so grateful to you, Michael, for the opportunity to work with you on all of this. And I love the fact that you never stop you know, that we've gone from the U.S. border to you work in, you know, northern France. And of course, there was lots of work before that. And now we're heading down to the border again in 2022 to continue our work from a new angle. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you on all of this. And I appreciate having this um, platform today with Andy Bookstores to, to share this children's book and to tell a little bit about the context in which that was created um, Christina, I'm going to hand it off to you. And I think you're muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Warren and Project Amplify for your leadership in this book. And thank you, Michael, and your work to make sure that this book can be read in languages that the children understand. I appreciate your time today, letting us be a part of this intimate and illuminating um, you know, conversation. Thanks also, of course, to Indies Unite and the work they do to explore the issues in this work and to leave, as they say, no curiosity unexplored. Also, of course, thanks to Bookshop for your work in organizing this important event. 
And finally, thanks to all those people who joined us today. Um, you know, you're here and you're supporting Hear My Voice and you're also, as you've learned, supporting children you may never meet. And that's very, very important. Remember, of course, a link for resources to use with this book, Hear My Voice, in, again, both English and in Spanish. I can't get over how excited I am about that. Um, will be, you know, linked to you after the event. And it was also linked to you in the beginning in the Q&A section. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.